I, I know you are, I'm, I'm sure you are, but I hope you are aware of the fact how marvelously blessed you are uh, to have music like you have and to hear the kind of preaching you have from your pastor, Dr. Mike Whitson. He's one of the greatest preachers in America. I will tell you he is. And uh, I, uh, I, I, you know, I, I pull him up on the uh, online sometimes and uh, listen to him preach, and I will tell you he is a marvelous, marvelous preacher. And thank you for uh, letting me be back here. He's so kind to invite me to come and, uh, and be with him uh, year after year after year. I'll tell you how you'll know he's in the will of God. If uh, I show up in a year's time, he is in the will of God. Now, if a year goes by and I don't uh, preach here, you know he's in a backslidden condition and needs to be prayed for, but you're so kind to let me come. Now, I'm told that I can preach as long as I would like to preach this morning, but at 20 minutes until 11, you're all going to get up and walk out. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you the clip version uh, of the message this morning, and uh, the, you'll get the full unabridged version, uh, ver, uh, version if you'll come at uh, 11 o'clock, but uh, I'm going to turn up the gear. I'm going to give a little bit faster delivery than I normally do, and so I hope you can uh, hang on here and follow me as we go along this morning. I want you to turn to the book of Acts chapter 1, and I'd like to read verses 9 through 12 as you follow along with me in your Bible. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. And when he had spoken, that is, when Jesus had spoken these things, while they beheld, that is, the disciples, he, Jesus, was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. While they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. Most of us live in so many of life's valleys, it helps us to climb a mountain every now and then. There was an old uh, Baptist preacher in North Georgia a number of years ago up in the mountains of North Georgia who said to me, every great event happened on a mountain. That is not far from the truth. You will study in your Bible and will find that many of the great events transpired on a mountaintop somewhere. So from time to time, I think it helps us as God's people to climb a mountain. Sometimes when I look at the world around me and wonder who is in control, I need to climb old ragged Mount Sinai and hear God say, I am that I am. Then there are times when I need to understand who Jesus is a little better and bring him into my life in a new and a fresh way. And so I climb old snow-capped Mount Hermon and I see the deity and humanity of Jesus embrace in transfigured splendor. Or sometimes I need to know about salvation and so I climb uh, old Mount Moriah and there I see Isaac receiving resurrection life by a substitute lamb. Then there are times when I wonder what's going to happen. Where is the world going? Is the whole thing going to explode? And so on those occasions, I climb uh, the uh, second coming mountain, which in the verses I have read to you today, we are told is Mount Olivet. What a marvelous mountain is the Mount of Olives. I have stood on that mountain. Your pastor has stood on that mountain. Perhaps many of you also have stood on the Mount of Olives. It was on this mountain, for instance, that Jesus in Matthew 24 laid out the essential events of his second coming. It is from this mountain that Jesus will ascend back to his Father in heaven. At the bottom of this mountain, Jesus spoke words of mystery, and he went up to Calvary. At the top of this mountain, he spoke words of majesty, and he went up to glory. So I want to talk with you this morning about this mountain, Mount of Olives, and I call it the second coming mountain. What a scene that must have been that day as the disciples gathered with Jesus on the mountain, and he's getting ready now to go back to heaven. For 40 days, Jesus had proven himself alive by many infallible proofs, and now he is getting ready to go back to heaven. 
And so the angels come with a cloud, and the cloud becomes the chariot, and the Lord Jesus Christ, right before their eyes, is lifted up. They brought his chariot from above to bear him to his throne, spread their triumphant wings, and said, the glorious work is done. And so Jesus left this earth and he went to heaven. Can you imagine what a celebration it was when Jesus went back to heaven? Can you imagine the angels as they must have lined old glory road and the Son of God returned with the nail prints of Calvary in his hand? When Jesus went walking through glory with blood strains from dark Calvary, I wonder if angels sang holy and bowed down and wept at his knee. Uh, one of these days, maybe I'll preach a message here about the ascension of the Lord and what happened when he went there. But this morning, what I want to do is to talk to you a little bit about what happened on Mount Olivet after Jesus went back what transpired in the lives of uh, these uh, apostles. Uh, the Bible tells us that two men in white apparel stood by them. We believe that these were angels because of their apparel. White apparel is normally the uh, garb of uh, the angels. We also believe that they were angels because of the announcement they made. They may well have been the same angels that announced at the tomb, he is not here, he is risen, as he said. So you see, these are good news angels. And they give the good news that Jesus Christ, who is going back to heaven, will so come in like manner as they have seen him go into heaven. So I want to talk with you this morning a little bit about what happened on this mountain so that as you and I climb that mountain together today, we might leave as they left the Mount of Olives. Now when you climb the second coming mountain, Number one, you are looking at a person. Did you notice the language that is used in these verses? Verse 9 says they beheld. It's just a normal uh, word for seeing something. But then in verse 10, it gets a little stronger. It says that they look steadfastly. And the uh, original word there carries the idea of looking intently. You see, this was no casual gaze. This was a casual glance. This was an intense gaze, and they were looking at the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear one, when we climb the mountain of Olivet together this morning, we are looking at a person, this same Jesus. Aren't you glad that Jesus is always the same? In the midst of a world that is filled with change like ours is, isn't it good to know that, that something stays the same? A lot of things change in our world. Customs change, culture changes, uh, all kinds of things. Hairstyles change. I, I heard about a, a preacher one time who changes his hairstyle and he, he, call, he combed it forward and he call, combed it backward. And someone said, how do you like your new hairstyle? He said, oh, I like it uh, pretty good, except folks keep coming up and whispering in my nose. And so uh, uh, things change, uh, but, but isn't it good to know that Jesus never changes? Uh, there's an interesting parallel verse over in Hebrews 13, verse 8, where it says almost the same language, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so Jesus is the Jesus of yesterday. He is the past Jesus. Look at him. Take another look at Jesus Christ uh, in his virgin birth. Look at him in his virtuous life. Look at him in his vicarious uh, atonement. Look at him in his victorious resurrection. Look at him in his glorious return to heaven. Jesus Christ is the same Jesus that he was yesterday. But then it says he is the same today. Day. Oh, I like that. Jesus Christ is the same today. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus still saves today. Did you know if you're in this building and you've never been saved, he will save you today. Uh, I'm 81 years of age now. I'll be 82, God willing, this year. I came to know Jesus as a nine-year-old boy. And, and I like to tell the story of when I came to the Lord. I was a nine-year-old boy sitting on the second row on a Sunday night in a Baptist church in Carrollton, Georgia. And I like to put it this way. I say uh, while I was there, uh, the Lord Jesus came walking in 
with a crown on his head and a cross on his back. And he stopped it right where I was and he said, young man, what can I do for you? And I said, oh, Lord Jesus, do for me what I cannot do for myself. I went forward and I gave my hand to Jesus, uh, to, to the preacher. I gave my heart to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I walked out of that building tonight, uh, that night I was a saved person and the stars lined up in a, a glory celebration and the branches of the trees clapped their hands in overwhelming joy and I walked away that night singing, oh, say, but I'm glad, I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Jesus has come and my cup's overrun. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Did you know you can walk out of this building today and be saved? He still saves today. Oh, by the way, something else about Jesus today, Jesus sanctifies today. Jesus can change people's lives today. I was thinking about 1 Corinthians 15 where it tells about the resurrection of our Lord and the fact that he was seen. And every time people saw the Lord Jesus, their lives were dramatically changed. Did you know there are people all around you this morning and their lives have been dramatically changed? There may be some sitting in this room today and they've served prison time, but Jesus has changed their life. There may be some here in this room today and uh, they live lives that were impure uh, and Jesus has changed their life today. Jesus still sanctifies today. Oh, something else about this Jesus. Jesus still satisfies today. I don't know about you, I'm satisfied with Jesus. Jesus has never let me down. Uh, somebody here this morning, you say, Preacher, I really need help. Preacher, I, I need uh, someone to, to help me today. I, I've got guilt in my life. I've got shame in my life. I've got sorrow in my life. Jesus can satisfy you with his peace and with his love and his grace. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, past Jesus, present Jesus, and then it says, and forever. And literally the phrase there, the word there means into the ages. Jesus is the perennial Jesus. He will always be the same. And so when Jesus comes again, he'll come back as the same Jesus. So when we talk about the second coming of our Lord, we're talking not just about an event, we're talking about a person. Back in the 1990s, there was a man named Scott O'Grady, and you may recall he was shot down in Bosnia, and for a period of days he was behind the enemy lines in, in Bosnia. And then we sit in our uh, jets, and the helicopter landed, and, and Scott O'Grady ran and was uh, miraculously, wonderfully uh, rescued from Bosnia and they flew him back to Andrews Air Force Base. And there was his family, and they were all waiting to see him, all looking for him. And the plane landed. Now, when the plane landed, do you think his family ran up and kissed the nose of the plane? Oh, no. No, it was not the event, but when the plane doors opened and he came down, they ran and they embraced and they kissed him. You see, it is the person who gives meaning to the event. And so we're talking about looking at a person this morning. Jesus Christ, the Savior. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus Christ, the soon coming Lord. But now notice, secondly, when you climb the second coming mountain, you also are listening to a promise. Now the words that the angel spoke here are couched in the language of a promise. It says, this same Jesus shall so come in like manner, shall so come in like manner. Those are the words of a promise. These are the words that Jesus Christ indeed is going to come again. Uh, you see, he'll come back as the same person as I've already indicated in the same manner. We believe in a literal return of Jesus. You see, you can't separate, you can't say that part of the life of Jesus or a ministry of Jesus is uh, literal and, and part of it is figurative. They all hold together. There was a literal virgin birth. There was a literal sinless life. There was a literal atoning death on Calvary's cross. There was a literal bodily resurrection from the dead. And when Jesus 
returns again, he will come back literally. Jesus stood on a literal mountain. Jesus was received by a literal cloud. Jesus was carried back to heaven through a literal sky. Jesus went to a literal heaven. Jesus sat on a literal throne, and Jesus will return in a literal body. So we are listening to a promise about the same person. But then notice also Jesus Christ, uh, we are told here that when he returns again, he will come for the same people. This same Jesus shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And that means he was going to come back for uh, his people, his disciples. And uh, we do believe that Jesus is going to come back for his uh, disciples and, and for his people. Uh, some, uh, some, when he comes, uh, they, they, he will come for them and they will experience resurrection. One of the things about the, the, the Easter Sunday we've just observed is that the resurrection of Jesus reminds us that one day we'll be resurrected as well. Can you imagine how that day is going to be? Can you see the graves uh, in uh, the cemeteries as they burst open and believers come forth? Uh, they say that over there in uh, Ireland there is a, a grave that has a, in, this engraving on a tombstone. Within, these, within this grave do lie, back to back my mate and I. When the last trump, uh, uh, when the last trump shall fill the air, if he gets up, I'll just lie here. Well, they must have had some marital problems there or something, but uh, I got news for them. If they're both saved, they're both going to come up at the same time. And uh, isn't it marvelous to think that there will be a literal resurrection? Some will come from beautiful memory gardens or country cemeteries. Others will come from the depths of the sea where they, their bodies are embalmed with seaweed. Uh, some will, will come from jungles where their bones have been picked bare uh, by uh, the uh, insects and the animals. There'll be a glorious resurrection. But if you and I are alive and remain uh, by the coming of the Lord, if Jesus should come today, then we will experience rapture. Uh, I was in Rome, Georgia a number of years ago as pastor and I was visiting a lady in our church and another lady from the church was there as well and uh, she said, oh, come on in, preacher. We're having a glorious time talking about the rupture of the church. <laughs> and uh, when I heard that, I said, that's truer than we want to admit in some churches. I'm not talking about rupture. I'm talking about rapture. I'm talking about in that moment when you are alive and remain and our bodies will be changed and we will go to be with the Lord in the air. Oh, Lord Jesus, how long, how long? Ere we shout the glad song, Christ returneth, Christ returneth, amen. So when we are listening to the promise, it is a promise he'll return as the same person. When we're listening to a promise, we have the promise that he will return for the same people and then we're told in the Bible that Jesus will return to the same place. He'll come back to that very Mount of Olives. Zechariah 14.4 makes this promise. It says, his feet shall stand in that day on the Mount of Olives. And then the verse says that the Mount of Olives will split open like a Georgia peanut hull. And the Lord Jesus will come from heaven. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. And then he will walk down that Mount of Olives. He will go across the Kidron Valley. He will walk up through the eastern gate. He will walk to the throne of his father. And he will sit there enthroned as the father's, at the Father's right hand. And Isaiah 24, 23 says this, the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion. You know, a number of years ago, uh, your pastor and I uh, went to the Holy Land together. Uh, as he suggested, there's some things we wouldn't dare tell uh, about what transpired there. I pulled a little joke on your pastor that I, I hope he doesn't share you know, anytime soon. But, uh, uh, you know, I've been to Jerusalem, but I, I, occasionally somebody says, are you ever going back to Jerusalem again? And I say, oh, yes, I, I'm going to be going back to Jerusalem. One of these mornings, I'll wake up in Jerusalem at the Millennium Marriott. 
and uh, I'll go out the entrance of the lobby and I'll take a little stroll on the streets of uh, Jerusalem and uh, I'll be walking there and I'll look and I'll say to a man, I, I-, I don't see any uh, policemen here. Uh, I don't see any soldiers here. And he'll say, well, of course there aren't any. Haven't you heard? The Lord reigns in Mount Zion and they'll study war no more. And then I'll see a lady selling roses and I'll go and buy some roses for my wife Janet and I'll say, oh my gracious, these roses don't have any thorns. And they'll say, well, of course there are no thorns. Haven't you heard? The Lord reigns in Mount Zion and the desert shall blossom as a a rose. And then I'll say, well, where are the hospitals and and where are the funeral parlors? And they'll say, there aren't any hospitals here. There aren't any funeral parlors here, haven't you heard? The Lord reigns in Zion, and the inhabitant will never say that they are sick. And so I'll walk to the gates of glory. I'll walk to the throne of God. I'll walk there before him, and I'll join the saints of God as we sing in millennial praise. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. We're climbing a mountain this morning. We're climbing the second coming mountain. And when you do, you're looking at a person. And when you do, you are listening to a promise. But now here's the next thing. When you climb this second coming mountain, you leave with a purpose. You see, God doesn't intend for us to stay on that mountain. But just like these disciples, we are to leave with a purpose. There they are. They're just looking their eyes out. They're catching that final uh, look at the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he disappears. And then those angels give the electrifying announcement that he is coming again. And the Bible says that those disciples went back to Jerusalem. Look at them. They're going down the side of that mountain with uh, feet uh, bounding, with hearts pounding, and they go back into Jerusalem. And the last verses of Luke chapter 24 give us a little insight into what they do. And you see, there should be a purpose. When we think about the coming of our Lord, there, there should be a purpose involved in it. We should leave with a purpose. One of those purposes is uh, to worship. It says that they returned to worship. And, uh, oh, you know, when people understand the the truth of the Lord coming again, it puts new vigor in your worship. It puts a new excitement. It puts a new thrill in your worship. Now, if Jesus is not coming again, uh, then what's it all about? Uh, If Jesus is not coming again, uh, then uh, let us cease our singing. If Jesus is not coming again, let the preachers close their Bibles and and quit their preaching. Let us have the benediction and let us all go home. But oh, ladies and gentlemen, if you really believe Jesus is coming again, it does something to invigorate the way you worship the Lord. You sing as you've never sung before, uh, the Lord is coming again. You preach as you have never preached before about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he can do for human lives. We leave to worship the Lord in a different way. But then here's the second thing. Not only do we leave to, to worship, but we leave also to work. There is a work to do. Uh, when I was a boy, they used to have some work songs. We don't sing many work songs anymore. Some of you old timers remember some of those songs. We'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. I heard your pastor talking about volunteers. God bless you wonderful people who volunteer in the work of the Lord. God bless you wonderful people who serve in various capacities, teach in Sunday school, work with boys and girls. And you see, a church doesn't just automatically grow. It takes work. God's people have to work to make it go. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 4, it says we're to do the work of an evangelist, which means that we are to do the work of leading people to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It takes a lot of prayer. It takes a lot of visitation. It takes a lot of cultivation. It takes a lot of love. It takes a lot of compassion to lead people to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But isn't it joyful when you do the work of an evangelist and you see somebody uh, walk down an aisle that you've been praying for? Isn't it great when you see them baptized in obedience to the command of our Lord? The work of an evangelist. A number of years ago, I was pastor of a church and God was just blessing us. We were just having the best time in the world, you know, and, and uh, man, you know, it, it was just wonderful. And, and, you know, not everybody gets happy when your church gets blessed. You do know that, don't you? Uh, when your church begins to grow and prosper, not everybody gets thrilled about it. And so some old boy up there around where I was said, you know, that vine's over there. He'd baptize a monkey if he could get him into the baptistry. <laughs> you know, that kind of hurt my feelings, Pastor. And then I got to thinking. I said, you know, come to think of it, I believe I have baptized a few monkeys. <laughs> and I said, and I know I have baptized some turkeys as well. And I'm positive I baptized a few donkeys along the way. And that wasn't what you thought I was going to say. But, but <laughs> oh, listen, you read the book of Acts after the ascension of Jesus and these disciples come running down that mountain, you will discover this pattern in the book of Acts. The Savior went up, the Spirit came down, and the saints went out. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got good news. Did you know there are thousands of people in Charlotte and they've never heard the good news about Jesus? They have not a clue what they could experience right here in this building as you do Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. We should leave with a purpose this morning. It is a purpose to work. But then also it is a purpose not only to worship and to work, but it is a purpose to uh, wait. The Bible says we are to live looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, the truth of the Lord's return ought to have a sanctifying effect on our daily life. Uh, the church is known as the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. A and we have a responsibility to keep our life clean and pure for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, the Bible says that, that uh, uh, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. It ought to cause us to live clean and pure lives. Does it ever bother you that, that human beings do things that animals don't do? Have you ever seen a billy goat smoking a, a cigarette? Ha have you ever seen a mule doing drugs? Ha have you ever seen a hog drinking liquor? I heard about an old hog stumbling through the woods one day, ran across a liquor still, and that old hog ate a bunch of that uh, liquor mashings, you know, and got just as drunk as a hog. And he went home and he disrupted the family and he caused turmoil in the neighborhood. And so the next morning they brought him before the hog council. And he was rather remorseful and rather repentant of it. And, and he said, uh, I, I know, brethren, that I, I upset my family last night and and I know that I disrupted the neighborhood last night, and, and I, I, I know I shouldn't have done that. But, but if y'all will forgive me this one time, I promise I will never act like a human being again. <laughs> oh, I don't know about you. I want to be clean and pure when Jesus comes, don't you? Don't you want to be living for him? Don't you want to be serving him when Jesus comes again? And so when we climb that mountain, we come down it with a purpose for our lives. Now here is old John the Revelator. John is writing about the end times. And you recall he wrote about the seven churches and the seven seals and the seven trumpets and, and uh, the seven bowls of, of wrath. And he wrote about the, the dragon and the beast out of the sea and the false prophet. And he wrote about the lion and the lamb. And when it was all over, on the last page of the Revelation, in the last page of your Bible, three times Jesus says, Behold, I come. And I can see old John now as he climbs up on top of one of those old black volcanic rocks on Patmos. And with arms uplifted, I can hear him as he shouts, Even so come, Lord Jesus. Can you do that this morning?
if Jesus should come this morning, would you be glad? Would you be ready? You can be ready today. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Maybe you're here in this service and you've never received Christ as your Savior. Wouldn't you like to know Jesus today? Wouldn't you like to walk out of this building knowing today that you're saved, that you belong to the Lord? You say, preacher, I really would, but I I don't know how to do that. I don't know how uh, to, to get saved today. I wonder if I could just help you this morning. Could, could I word a simple little prayer for you? And if this prayer becomes your prayer, would you pray it to the Lord? Now, I know that the prayer doesn't save. Jesus saves. But God uses means to get us to Jesus. So wherever you are in the building, make this your prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on a cross for me. Forgive me of all my sins. Come into my life, Lord Jesus, and save me right now. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.